What's up, everybody? I'm just taking a second to get this going. I'm going to get a couple things set up real quick. Give me one second here. We'll get started in a few minutes. Okay. What's up, guys? Do a flip? I can't do a flip. Sorry. Um, hell yeah. There's like 500 people, 600 some people in here. It's crazy. All right. Well, <clears throat> I hope everybody's doing good. Let me move this over here so I can look at my notes. Um, I am broadcasting to you live from uh, from a basement where my drums are set up currently. And it's actually my parents' basement. Um, I don't live with my parents, but I kind of wish I did. It's awesome here. But uh, I'm broadcasting live from the basement. This is where I keep my drums. And uh, you know, I really appreciate everybody joining in. So today, I just wanted to do a, a free workshop for non-drummers, it's going to be beneficial information for drummers too, for sure, but this is really geared towards songwriters, producers, uh, you know, pe people that play other instruments aside from drums and create music, um, and this all kind of came to be a thing recently when myself, Misha, Nolly, and uh, Dez from, uh, from Good Tiger launched our new company, Get Good Drums. So Get Good Drums is um, drum it's a drum sample library, it's drum sound software, uh, and uh, you know, it's really made for people that are writing and composing music. So you know, you don't just want to have good sounding samples, you want to actually know how to come up with the parts. Now. In a couple weeks or a week or so, Misha may do his own class on actually how to really like program the drums really well. But um, in this regard, I really wanted to get on my drum set and walk through some ideas and some concepts for just actually coming up with the the right parts for your music and and not just you know throwing it together and hoping it's cool. I think what makes good music a lot of times at least for a drummer like me is hearing a drum part that's well crafted it doesn't need to be the busiest craziest thing ever it doesn't need to have tons of fills it just needs to be the right part for the song so i'm sure you guys know of a lot of bands that you like that have you know parts like that um you know i love the deftones because i feel like abe cunningham writes amazing parts that fit perfectly they're not complex they're not crazy they're just just right for the song so you know that's kind of what I want to talk about today is again not the Deftones and how Abe writes, but some of the things that I use to you know compose the drum parts for the songs that we play as a band, but also some tips for you when creating your own stuff. So let's uh, let's start there. So and I will do some playing. I may reference some of the new stuff if you guys want at the end. I can play through uh, one of the songs or at least part of it from the new record. But um, so. Here's the cool thing about being a guitar player or being a songwriter that plays a really melodic instrument is you're connected to the melody and that's where all of this needs to start. So focus on the melodies and focus on understanding the feel, the vibe, you know, what kinds of melodies are you writing? What is the main sort of linear focus part of the song? What, what is like the, the one melody you can hum, um, you know, so when I think of like a song like Flatline, I think of like the first riff and I can hum each of those notes in a linear pattern. So now that's the intro. I'm probably out of tune, um, but it's some good funny stuff for you. But uh, anyway, focus on the melody. What is the melody expressing? Is it a sad feel? Is it a happy feel? Is it energetic? And along with the melody, focus on kind of where you feel the pulse, where you bob your head. Um, you know, what is, what is, where's the melody taking you rhythmically, right? What kind of notes are you playing? Are you playing really loose strumming notes or are you playing on the piano and it's very soft and light or is it more aggressive? A lot of those things you can determine just by listening to the melody and feeling what comes from the melodies that you write. So let's start there. Next, you really want to find the pulse. So within a melody, where do you feel the groove? So like, that same uh, melody for flatline. So do 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 To me, the way that I feel that pulse is kind of on that like more halftime head bob. I could feel it like this do 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 da do 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 da, which probably looks funny, but that doesn't feel right. It's too it's too much. It's too far. It's pushing it too far forward. Whereas if we did it really slow, like do 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 ga do 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 ga da, it's that's kind of dragging, it's too slow. So literally bob your head and figure out based on like 
the quarter notes, the half notes, the eighth notes, the sixteenth notes, where it feels best to find the pulse first and foremost. So where do you bob your head? And if you can find that really nice space within the melody you write to bob your head, then from there, you know, you can really build the feel, the groove that's going to really give people that pulse, you know, it, it, at least from a good starting point, you can build it from there. So after that, we focus on the backbeat. Okay, so usually the backbeat is like the main snare drum hit within a song. So again, let's use the idea of flatline. Um, the the melody do 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 da do 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 da do do da do do da do 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 ga. So all you need is da do 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 ga. That's the groove. That's the main backbeat. So I'm gonna tap lightly on the drums and hum at the same time. Probably doesn't sound that great, but we're gonna try it out. This is what. This is the only thing you need to make that melody feel good. So one, two, three, four. Do 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 I'm not playing the kick drum. I'm not playing the hi hat. I'm not playing any other pieces of the drum set except literally putting a backbeat on the two and four of a four four count. That's all. And what that does is it gives the listener the exact example of where they should bob their head and where they should feel the pulse and where they should feel the groove. So just placing the snare drum in the right spot can get you really far when coming up with the right drum part for a certain section. So we can experiment with this, and you should, and we'll talk about that later. But find that backbeat, whatever that placement is, that allows the song to be digested in a simple and easy manner. Okay, so let's start there. So then the next piece to this is figuring out where to place the kicks. Okay, so out of that guitar melody that I've been humming terribly, there's a lot of potential spaces that I could put the kick drum patterns or, or, or even just the other rhythms surrounding the backbeat. So before I actually play on the full kit, I'm just going to tap it out on the rim and dynamically, and this is something that guitar players or people at their producing desk can do if they just use their hands and they tap out a part. Don't try to program it before you can tap out something. So tap out ideas for that bass drum part. So I'm going to hum it again. One, two, three. You could do something like this. Do, 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 So if you can tap these parts out in a linear fashion, one beat at a time, place kick drums that enhance the rhythms and the sounds of the melodies around a backbeat that gives you the pulse and that gives you the feel, then you're off to a great start. We haven't even touched the actual hi-hat pulse yet. We haven't touched any of the other drums, any of the cymbals. We're simply just putting in kick and snare. So if I were to play that now actually with my kick and snare, okay, and you guys can probably just see the computer. Um, let's move this over so we can get some some action here without anything else the song uh, flatline just the intro part would sound like this one two three four Okay, so again, that's just the basic framework for that song. It's just kick and snare, no ghost notes, no extra hits, no spice rack filler stuff. We're just slowly building it from the kick drum and snare drum to match the melody. All right, so next thing we want to do is we actually want to enhance and show the pulse. So this is where you guys, if you're programming uh, specifically, you could now start adding in the cymbals and whatever symbol you want. So experiment with this. Pick maybe the hi-hat initially just to keep the pulse. So I'm gonna clamp this down here, close it down so it's not super loud, but check this out. So now, when I play that same groove between my kick and snare, if I add in the pulse, it starts to sound even, even better. So.
okay? And we're not really focused on dynamics yet. We're not really, again, focused on like slicing it up. We're just trying to get the feel. So does the melody feel good with the groove? And if you can say yes to that question and you still only just have a very basic framework, then you're absolutely on the right path as far as writing the right drum part for the part you're writing. Wow, that sounded, that was, that was like a neat thing that, anyway, I'm gonna shut up. Okay, so, um, from here, something that's really important, let me just get that out of the way, something that's really important to focus on um, is understanding to the subdivision of which you're sort of writing the song within. So when it comes to a song like, like Flatline, okay, let's think about the fastest rate that's occurring within the melody and, and the rhythms that are being played. So like, if, if I count the pulse again, so, most of that, most of, of the subdivisions that you're hearing are the 16th notes. So, one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a da 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 when that when that groove first kicks off, I do like a, a, a triple hit on the kick drum, which actually showcases the 32nd note. So dig it do got do do do. So although the bulk of that whole section is being felt and played in like a 16th note subdivision, you could potentially write fills or come up with other parts that do fall in that 32nd note space. Okay, but we'll get there. So you really again you just want to understand what the rate of the song you're playing sort of, sort of is in and you want to understand the subdivisions that you can utilize without it sounding too crazy, right? We don't want to go too far out the box with a rhythm that's like in 16th notes da, 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 and start going like and playing, you know, 32nd note triplets like or they just they don't line up. It doesn't really make sense, okay? So anyway, um, from there, something that's really, really important is now, and this is where we get into like the small nuances and really, really, really finding, you know, a, a way to sort of make these grooves creative, make them your own. Again, use the spice rack, spice them up a little bit. That's when we get into dynamics, okay? So this is where we start using things like um, ghost notes. We start, you know, using softer hits, louder hits, we can start, you know, substituting other pieces of the drum set um, for, for, you know, different things. Like, for example, there's, there's a, a section in that song where I, or actually in that same section, I start using ghost notes on the snare drum in between the hits. So check this out. Let me, let me show you guys what I mean. So we have the, uh, the very stripped down way to do this song, like this, again. But then, if we think about the rate again, which is one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a, okay? If you focus on that and you place other hits within that subdivision, you can really support the groove better. So check it out. Now, instead of just playing the very basic, you know, kind of linear selective 16th patterns, I'm gonna fill in those 16 note subdivisions, but in a way that doesn't take over, and this is the most important part, in a way that doesn't take over what's happening with the main kicks and the main backbeat of the snare. And this is where dynamics come into play. This is why you wanna figure out how to play these softer and figure out ways to hit beats and hit rhythms and hit patterns and hit sounds that don't distract from the backbeat or the main kicks, but simply enhance it. So check it out. Here's, here's an example of what I mean. So one, two, three, Four.
hopefully you guys could hear that okay. Hopefully it didn't sound too shitty. But uh, that should give you an idea of actually how to utilize the space between the main accents. Hopefully you can hear that all of those accents I'm playing in between in those subdivisions, they're not loud. They're not taking over the main backbeat. You can still hear this part. And even if I take away the hi-hat, right, I can fill in spaces like this. So, and someone's sending a question, so ghost notes are softer notes. Um, that add to the main beat. Exactly, right? Ghost notes are simply just softer dynamics than the main accents within the song. They don't just need to be on the snare drum. They can be all over the kit, but you have to make sure that sonically they come in softer and they come in in, in sort of a support role to help make the other main accents sound better. Okay, so, so that's what I want you to focus on if you're going to write in ghost notes or kind of fill in spaces, right? Now, some other things to think about. When we play the hi-hat, right? We don't need it to always sound exactly the same. Like it shouldn't always sound like. And if you're going to program parts, don't program hi-hat or pulse hits on the ride or the stack with just straightforward hits that all sound the same. Focus on how a drummer would move, right? The mechanics, right? So I don't play like this. It's not rigid, right? It's loose. So every hit's going to be a little different. I actually move like kind of in a figure eight motion or like a very loose motion when I play the hi-hats like that. So like check this out. I do stuff like... Um So do you see how just on one instrument, like a hi-hat, I can utilize all these different sounds, right? The same thing goes for the stack. If I'm going to play a groove over here, like... Same thing if I use the toms now, right? So I'll, I'll kind of angle it this way. The same thing if I use the toms. Sorry about that, guys. I got totally disconnected. My phone just shut right off. Um, so I'll let you guys come back in and we'll continue this whole thing. Um, sorry about that, everybody. Let me make a post in here. Cool. So people are coming in slowly, getting back in. Sorry about that. Again, I apologize. My bad. <laughs> okay. So, everybody can watch this later, so I'm going to keep this going, um, and you'll just come in when you come in. But, uh, <clears throat> so anyway, what I was just talking about was utilizing ghost notes, understanding that you can use softer hits, louder hits, and it doesn't always need to be on the snare drum, you know, it, and it needs to fit into the right subdivision for the song. So, let's, let's go from here. Um, let's see. All right, this is a really big point for everybody. Okay, now I know I was just on, in the other video and the other stream, I was sort of, you know, messing around and having fun and, and, and experimenting with things. But what's really important when you write these drum parts and when you are messing around with dynamics and ghost notes and the spice rack, so to speak, is that you really, really, really want to keep it simple. Okay, don't get bogged down in trying to come up with like 
the absolute best part for the song. There, there is no best part. Maybe there is eventually when you really set on it, but what's the best part a lot of times is the part that you become used to, is the part that feels the best. It might not even be something that you can craft right away. Sometimes the best part is something that you put in place to keep simple and then you go away from it and you listen back and it becomes that standard or the default of what you, what you want it to sound like, of what you want the groove to sound like, you know? Um, so I think it's important to keep it simple. Now, you know, the beauty of, of, of drum programming in this regard, and this is why, you know, a lot of drummers will say to me, oh man, like drum programming, you're taking away our jobs. I completely disagree with that. Periphery uses drum programming so that we can demo all of our parts and all of the songs that we put on the record and so that we can sit with them and tweak them over time. When we write parts, and specifically drum parts, and program them, we don't come up with the parts you hear on the record right off the bat. A lot of times we start just by simply building a very basic framework like I've described so far. Then, over time, we can go in, and with drum programming, it's super easy. We just click around, we, we place in different sounds, we place in different beats, we try things, we experiment, right? We don't just go for the moon. We just try to make little tweaks and, and go back, and that's what's so cool about it. If you program in something in that absolutely sounds terrible and you hate it, you simply just take it out and you, you, you go back to what you started with. But if you find something that's awesome, then don't try to finalize it. Put something in place print it down, you know, or, or I should say, you know, bounce a copy of it, listen to it in your car for about a week, see if you like the part. If you keep hearing things in your mind that stick out to you, like, man, I don't like that snare drum, I don't like these ghost note placements, I don't like these accents, then the beauty, again, with drum programming, before you commit it to the record, is that you can go back and you can change the parts, and you can, you can craft them exactly how you want them to be. So when Periphery wrote this new record, we actually programmed all of the drum parts, you know, over a period of six weeks. We got the frameworks done when we wrote each song, but it took about six weeks to like really hone them and craft them and figure out what we we're going to play. Part of that process was programming ideas that we had and trying them out. But then the other part of that process was me coming down to the drum set here and experimenting with them and listening to them in my car when I drive and figuring out, you know, this works, this doesn't. And then I would go back and we would tweak it. And but then by the time I actually went to go record the real drum parts at that point, that's when I settled and had already settled on exactly which parts I was going to use for the real songs. So in that regard, um, I think drum programming is amazing for drummers because it gives you a chance to go back and tweak things and get things right before you actually go perform it and commit it to a record. Anyway, that was just a really important part I wanted to bring up. So I think when you guys write parts, don't shoot for the moon. Don't try to come up with the most ridiculous stuff. Start simple. Okay, start with the melody, okay? Think about how the melody feels again, what the melody, uh, you know, sort of pushes you to, to do. Does it push you to bob your head a certain way? Does it push you to feel something? You know, what, what are you trying to get across with your music, with the lyrics, with the, with the guitar part, with the keyboard part, with the ambience? Then focus on from there finding the pulse within that and how does this... How do you bob your head again? How do you feel the groove physically? How would, if there was an audience, how would they dance to this? How would they bob, bob their heads to it, right? And physically feel that. When you walk down the street, try to walk to, to the ideas you have and figure out where that pulse would be. Is it the faster pulse? Is it the softer pulse? Is it the medium pulse? And then I think from there, what's, what's really important is to place in just the main accents. Where does the snare drum fall? Where does the kick drum fall? How does it work together? And then once you have that basic framework from there, fill in the spaces with the actual pulse on the ride, the hi-hat, the, the stack, whatever it is. And then from there, you will get out our spice rack and we really, 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 you know, fill it in the way that we wanted to. So hopefully that was helpful. This was definitely a sort of crash course in this topic. And, and you know, I, I, I don't want to get too granular because I don't want you guys to be spending so much time on these little tweaks and little parts, but just understand that dynamics are super important when programming drums or when even performing drum parts, okay? And how they're important is that they, they work off not only what's happening musically with the rest of the band and the music that's playing, but they work off the main parts of the groove. 
the kick drum needs to fall where it needs to fall because of the accents of a song. The snare drum needs to fall where it should fall to help people feel the groove. The pulse on the hi-hat is there to kind of keep the band in time and let the audience know where the time is happening, okay? But the dynamics and the really special little nuances that you can put in your music, they're the things that fall in between all those other parts. They're the things that come in that will really make what you do creative. And a lot of that has to do with how you feel something physically. How do you move and how does that translate to the sound and to the kit? So hopefully this was helpful. If you guys do have follow-up questions, you can comment in this thread and I'll do my best to, uh, to address them. But... Uh, Otherwise, um, hopefully this was helpful. We'll be putting out tons of helpful content, either you know from the periphery page or even the Get Good Drums page, um, and uh, you know we're we're trying to really give everybody a good chance to learn a lot of different things. You know how to write songs, how to come up with cool drum parts, how to program those drum parts, what software to use, what techniques we use. We get asked this stuff all the time, so we figure, you know what, let's share it with everybody. We have the means to now, so hopefully uh, hopefully it's value, valuable information, okay? So, all right, to end this whole thing, um, I will see how much I can jam through of, uh, of the song Flatline, start to finish. Uh, I'm not using a click, so the tempos might be off. Um, it might be a little bit faster, but let's see what I can get through before this thing actually cuts off again. Uh, hopefully, the sound doesn't make it chop off. But I'm gonna play through. Uh, I'm gonna play through Flatline for you guys and give you a little taste of it, and it's gonna be real rough. So here we go. Hopefully, you can see that. Let's move this here. All right, I'm gonna try to do my best to remember uh, the exact tempo without using a metronome because my metronome is on my phone and my phone is broadcasting right now. So here we go.
All right. Well, hopefully that wasn't too pitiful. A little bit fast, I think. A lot of symbols. Hopefully you could hear it, but that was just uh, a quick playthrough of an unrehearsed flatline. So I hope you guys liked it. Anyway, um, this ended up being two broadcasts. The first one cut off. So uh, if you're watching this one now, go back and watch the one before it for the bulk of the information on how to write drums. And then you can check out some more information in this one. And then obviously if you want to watch that uh, sort of mediocre playthrough of Flatline, you can do that here. So anyway, guys, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Our new record comes out this, wait, not this month. It's almost July. It comes out July 22nd. It's got Flatline. It's got The Price is Wrong and nine other songs that hopefully you'll like on it. And uh, yeah, just launched GGD. If you guys are producers, if you are songwriters, if you're looking for really good drum sounds to use in your mix. Actually, if you're looking to use my drum sounds, and in fact, it's this drum set that I'm playing right here. If you're looking to get these sounds tuned up, different heads, different sizes, uh, then just go to getgooddrums.com. You can listen to our sounds, our samples, uh, and then you can grab a copy. And it is currently uh, still at the introductory rate, which will go up July 1st. So you have between now and July 1st to get it for a good price. So not to do the shameless self-promotion, but I'm going to shameless self-promote. Getgooddrums.com. Check it out. Get Periphery's new record, July 22nd. Go pre-order it right now. And uh, that's what I got. I hope you guys have a great day. Thank you so much for, for joining in. You are the fucking best fans ever. I love you. Mwah. See you later.